This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. Last week was the convention of the California AFL-CIO, which was held in San Francisco. And the California AFL-CIO represents over 2 million workers in California. It's the largest state federation in the country. And it addressed some of the issues facing the working class, including the rise of fascism, the right wing, international labor solidarity, and the lessons of the struggle at Amazon. And joining us today is Cliff Smith. He's a business manager of Roofers Local 36 in Los Angeles. He spoke at the convention and raised a number of resolutions. Welcome to Workweek. How you doing? Maybe you can talk about those resolutions and why you introduced them to the state AFL-CIO convention. We introduced three resolutions, and generally they're designed to push the leadership of the state federation to use its its uh, influence and resources to provide political leadership. And uh, as you say, we're, we're in a very dangerous moment with the increasing threat of fascism, not just as a, a street level uh, formation, but through the highest levels of government. And so the, the first uh, resolution was taking the language from the AFL-CIO constitution that uh, prohibits any affiliate to uh, support authoritarian or tyrannical uh, agencies, uh, prohibit them from participating in the AFL-CIO. And so our resolution said that therefore no affiliate should be able to promote the Republican party. Um, and it went through a chronology since the January 6th fascist attempted coup of how the Republican Party as a, as a body has moved to uh, cover up and uh, conspire after the fact, if not before the fact, with the uh, attempt to overturn the election results and block the certification. So the leadership of the uh, Federation uh, promoted um, non-concurrence with that resolution without explaining it. Uh, one of the guests at the convention was Chris Smalls. And Chris, in his comments to the convention, said that he was concerned that if the Republicans take over Congress again, they're going to use their power to crush the labor movement. And Chris is exactly right. And and this is it's not just possible, it's very likely. We, you know, we, we know what the agenda of the Republican Party is. Um, we saw certainly on January 6th that they have no uh, investment in uh, even the, the pretense of, you know, the bourgeois democratic process that uh, there's, there's nothing that they, they will not do to, to maintain power. And if they're given those uh, official uh, positions, you know, as, as Chris says, <laughs> we can expect that uh, unions will be uh, number one on their uh, list of targets. Uh, labor unions, for all their shortcomings, are, are very effective at uh, mobilizing uh, votes on Election Day. And that's, that's something that is a, a great threat to the Republican Party. And, and so for that reason alone, they would definitely uh, attack labor unions. And the fact that somebody like Chris Smalls, who's, who's young, who's uh, relatively new and recent into the labor movement, can see this clearly, you know, is a, is a shame to uh, veteran, experienced, um, established uh, union leadership, because they, they have all this information, they have all this analysis, they have all types of departments and analysts, uh, and, and, and resources to provide this information to them. So it, it's clear, it's not something that, you know, requires a great deal of, uh, you know, information, it, it, it's, it's obvious. And the resolution that you, you were on the floor and you quoted was that uh, from your head of the building trades saying that they supported the prosecution of these people. So this was the second resolution and, uh, you know, I have a lot of issues with Sean McGarvey and the North America's Buildings Trades Unions uh, organization. 
You know, they brought Donald Trump to speak at their legislative conference when he was elected in 2017. I was there at the uh, conference and, you know, protested that. I was threatened by McGarvey's uh, officials with being evicted from the convention and from the hotel. Um, but by January 6th, you know, even even somebody as malleable as Sean McGarvey recognized the, the clear and present danger of what was happening. And his statement to me was the most uh, ad advanced position I saw from labor uh, anywhere. And it, it said flatly that uh, this is a, a, a imminent threat to democracy and that it must be met with uh, with with direct uh, response and that the uh, Republican senators and Congress members that had uh, stated that they would not certify the election, all of them must be removed from power, that Trump and his cabinet at that time must resign, or, and if not, that um, they should all be considered as co-conspirators and that uh, there should be a bipartisan investigation and they should all be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So. You know, th this was uh, a, a position coming from the highest levels of the Buildings Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. Um, none of those demands have been realized. Uh, Senators Cruz and Hawley, who, who led that uh, movement from, from within, are, are still in their positions. Most of the, the House members, uh, the, these Republican uh, insurrectionists, are still in their positions. And they've uh, refused to participate in setting up a, a bipartisan congressional committee. They've stonewalled every uh, attempt to investigate. Um, and they continue to this day to provide interference to protect Trump and to, to protect uh, this, this fascist uprising. And so, you know, as, as Sean McGarvey stated, all of these people must be considered as co-conspirators and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And so the, the, the resolution that we brought was, was nothing beyond just reiterating what the Buildings Trades national leadership demanded on January 6th. And again, the California Labor Federation leadership uh, recommended non-concurrence, which is, you know, it's amazing to me that they couldn't even stand in support of a position that established AFL-CIO leadership has already put forward. Why is that? It sounds uh, bizarre. I mean, here's a threat of fascism and you're, you're not gonna even say that these people should be prosecuted for having an insurrection and attempted coup? Yeah, why indeed? Uh, you know, the only explanation that I can uh, imagine from their point of view is that they don't want to uh, disturb, in their mind, uh, rank and file union members who uh, still are in support of the Republican Party or still in support of Trump. And I, I guess they think that by putting uh, a, such a position forward that, uh, that that would maybe turn some of these rank and file workers uh, away from the union. But, you know, I, <laughs> I, I think that any any losses that that you might have in your membership from uh, Trump affiliated members, you know, will be far far uh, overcome by the the support of the larger working class that is aware of this threat. What happened after you introduced the resolution? You no, know, the the process uh, stated that you had to submit the resolutions by July 11th uh, to be timely. So uh, the, those two I submitted uh, before July 11th. And then, uh, you know, I, I got a confirmation that they were received, but then no information beyond that. So I had to kind of, you know, push and prod a little bit to, to find out what their status was. Um, they, they went into the resolutions committee the day before the convention started. And uh, I don't know what type of, you know, discussion was had. And then, you know, when when the resolutions committee gave its report on the final day of the convention, just before the votes were taken, you know, the, all that was said was that the uh, recommendation of the executive board was for non-concurrence, basically opposing 
the, the proposals, no explanation of why, like no, no room to engage in any kind of, even to have a disagreement, you know, like, you know, if we disagree, then we disagree, but at least let's understand what the, what the ideas are. And not even that, just, you know, recommendation of not concurrence moving forward. And, you know, it, it's, it's, I would say frustrating just in terms of the process, because you, you want to feel as a, as a delegate, you know, a, as a leader in my local union, that there's a, an opportunity to engage and to have some type of discussion and present an idea. And, you know, if the idea isn't supported democratically, then, you know, so be it, but at least to have some, some uh, understanding of, of where the, the thought is at. And were the delegates provided with copies of the resolutions, all the resolutions that have been not properly any, submitted? I, not at any time, you know, and, you know, certainly not before the convention started, which, you know, would, would have been, I think, better if any resolution that was submitted on time would have been available so that at least all the delegates could have, you know, considered them. And, and had some, you know, ideas or discussion about them. But even during the convention itself, after they were reported by the resolutions committee, uh, it, it was it was announced that they were available on the website, but I, I still could not find them. You know, if they were on the website, I couldn't locate them and I still can't. So you really don't know other resolutions uh, from other locals of important issues? They never saw the light of day. Is that the case? As I understand, or as as it appeared, all the resolutions that were submitted were re reported on on the final day of the convention, just before there was an official vote. If there were other resolutions that were submitted that were that were not reported, you know, even if the recommendation was not concurrence, I, I I'm not aware of whether there were or there weren't. But you know, certainly the they didn't provide us with very much, you know, information to, to work with. And the debate, you uh, spoke on that and also international solidarity, the need to have a united front of all unions around the world. What was that? Why did you present that? I was uh, sent a letter by my, my union's international president that stated that he had spoken to the national AFL-CIO office. He didn't identify any specific person, but just the office. And he said that the national AFL-CIO office says that it's not an option for my local union to be affiliated to the World Federation of Trade Unions. Uh, it didn't state any chapter or verse of the constitution of the AFL-CIO. That, that would, you know, prohibit this affiliation. Um, before we affiliated, I had our union's attorney review all of, you know, the local constitution of bylaws, the international's constitution of bylaws, the AFL-CIO's constitution. And he provided us with a very thorough written summary where he stated that he saw nothing whatsoever in any of these documents that would prohibit our affiliation so you know he's he's a very well respected buildings trades lawyer he represents the los angeles and orange county buildings trades council and then we retain him for our local you know as well so he you know he's not uh you know some you know amateur lawyer on the margins he's not a politically motivated you know radical he's he's a died in the wool buildings trades construction union lawyer. And, you know, he, he gave us this determination and that's what we followed in our affiliation. So to get a letter from our international president saying, well, the national AFL-CI office said it's not an option, but to not have any support for that position, you know, raises a lot of questions to me and to my members. And so that's why we, we brought this resolution to the convention urging the California Labor Federation of the AFL-CIO to, to 
put forward a position, uh, just a general sentiment urging unity of the World Federation of Trade Unions with the International Trade Union Confederation to which the AFL-CIO is affiliated internationally. And, you know, again, they, they couldn't see fit to even uh, express, express a, a, a sentiment of working class international solidarity and instead they kicked it upstairs to the national AFL-CIO office. So I'll, I'll be curious to see, you know, if there's a response, what, you know, what they're going to say, because at, at some point, if they're going to tell us it's not an option to affiliate to the WFTU, I have to think that they're going to have to support that. And they can't just say, well, because we said so, but you know, I, nothing would surprise me, honestly. Well, the, the AFL-CIO uh, has a long history of anti-communism. Um, uh, they get uh, $75 million a year for the Solidarity Center uh, for activities around the world. The California AFL-CIO has actually passed a resolution in the past calling for opening the books of the AFL-CIO's international operations. And it seems that they want to continue this policy um, of not uniting with workers around the world who they have some political differences with. Well, you know, I, I think that that's, that's clear to people that have paid attention to the history of the AFL-CIO, you know, that it's uh, more closely aligned to, to capital and to Democratic Party uh, political uh, viewpoints than to working class and proletarian viewpoints. But at the same time, the WFTU is not an ideological organization. It, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a political party. It, you know, it, it makes no demands of, of its uh, members and affiliates other than that they represent the interests of the working class. It's democratic, um, it's class oriented, meaning it, it takes up the position of the working class without compromise or, or uh, concession. It's openly anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist as any labor organization should be. So again, on the surface, there's nothing that would seem to prevent any labor union in the AFL-CIO from operating seamlessly with the positions of the World Federation of Trade Unions. And one of the speakers at the convention was Gavin Newsom. And Gavin Newsom uh, and his uh, Cal OSHA have not uh, really increased the number of OSHA inspectors or less than 200 California OSHA inspectors in the midst of this pandemic. What do you think about the relationship of the California Democratic, uh, California Democratic Party to the trade unions in California? Well, you know, the, it's clear that they prioritize business, profits, capital. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is probably the leading Democrat from the state of California, and she's stated plainly that the Democratic Party is a capitalist party. And, you know, there's really nothing else, <laughs> you know, there's no reason to think that she's, you know, <laughs> not not being candid. Um, so, you know, I didn't really pay attention to Governor Newsom's comments during our lunch, but as far as uh, OSHA, it's, it's severely understaffed. Um, there's an enormous amount of uh, health and safety uh, risks and violations in all sectors of work, you know, certainly in the building and construction trades, it's a constant hazard on any project. And, you know, that's not to mention other, other sectors, you know, healthcare, uh, service industries, hospitality, you know, we, we all have our different risks and there needs to be uh, standards and regulations and oversight. And it's not enough to just have them on paper because when we try to call in a, a complaint or a grievance, if there's not an inspector or somebody to come in and investigate it, the, the complaint goes nowhere and the, the, the risks and the dangers remain. And is that the reason, one of the reasons you support the idea of a workers party? I mean, for that reason, among you know many others, we, we need to have a political organization that represents the interests of working people uh, without compromise, and, and that does not exist. And the the union movement should be 
uh, making a priority out of building that type of political organization. And unfortunately, it's not. It's not. And I, I think that that's our biggest, uh, our, our biggest problem as, as the labor movement in the United States is we, we're, there's no interest among the leadership in uh, establishing a, a, a political organization of by and for working people. And this uh, rise of fascism and the rejection of your proposal to prosecute the uh, people who tried to overthrow the government and do an insurrection, you think it has to do with the fact they don't want to conflict with the Democrats, the Democratic Party? Um, you know, they don't want to conflict with the Democratic Party, but even worse, they don't want to conflict with the Republican Party, you know, and it's it's just a really sad state of affairs because, you know, this isn't 10 or 20 years ago where, you know, to, to discuss the threat of fascism, you know, it seems like abstract or, you know, some some kind of far away thing. You know, it's it's here and it's in front of us. Um, the, the convention had Dolores Huerta as a, a, a keynote speaker at the reception on the on the first night. Um, and Dolores Huerta, you know, spoke openly that fascism is as at our doorstep and the threats that we face, you know, the same analysis that Chris Smalls was putting forward from his, you know, young uh, viewpoint. Dolores Huerta was saying the same thing from her position of, of leadership and experience as an elder. And so, you know, it, it, it's hard to, it's hard to excuse the, the official leadership for, uh, you know, keeping their head in the sand. You know, there's no time to be played with right now. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking with Cliff Smith, who's a business manager of Roofers Local 36 in Los Angeles, who was a delegate at the convention of the California Federation of Labor and introduced some resolutions on these issues. So thanks for joining us on Workweek. All right, Steve, take care.